Okay, so types of wounds. So, um, so these slides will just go through the various types you might see. Some of the terms maybe you'll use in documentation. So when we get down to the lab, I did up a little sheet that has some of those tips on it for what you would want to write down if you were documenting about a wound. So again, as CCAs, you're, pro you're not going to be doing like complicated wound care, like changing, probably not changing sterile dressings, probably not doing those things. But if you find a wound, you have to document about it. If there's a change or you find there's a lot of drainage or a dressing is peeling off or has fallen off, those are all things that you'll have to document because you are the one that found it. And then you'll have to document that you notified the um, supervising staff about it. Okay, so what you did about it. So the first one's an intentional wound. So an intentional wound is you go for surgery and they cut your skin, sew it back together hopefully, or it could be even getting a needle. So if you go for a vaccination, that's causing a wound in your skin. So that was intentional on purpose. Uh, so that would be one. So down in the lab, we do have someone that has a, a couple intentional wounds down there. So that will be something you could, you might document. So unintentional, so this could be cutting yourself while cooking. So just some kind of accident or trauma um, in long-term care. One that's pretty common is a skin tear. So you see a lot of skin tears or bruising. Um, so just ones that weren't intentional. So those are kind of common sense. You can think about the difference with, with those. So again, open wound means the skin or mucous membrane. So mucous membrane, again, were, was kind of the same kind of tissue, but it's the tissue that will give off mucus. So like the lining of your mouth or nose or the lining of your digestive tract or the lining of your lungs. So all of those things have mucous membranes. So an open wound would be when the skin or mucous membrane is broken. So pretty much all intentional wounds are going to um, be an open wound. There are not many procedures that happen. Like they don't bruise people on purpose without puncturing the skin. So most of them are going to be intentional. Um, or then a lot of unintentional ones are open wounds too. But like, yeah, so if you cut your skin, that would, with a knife by accident, that was an unintentional wound and it's also open. Okay. So the closed wound would be like bruising. So it's tissue trauma. So there's still tissue that was damaged in some way, um, but the skin's not broken or mucous membrane's not broken. So it could be a broken bone unless the bone went through the skin, then it would be an open wound, right? Or uh, any kind of bruising. So especially in the elderly, sometimes you'll see their arms covered in bruises because their tissues already um, has poor skin integrity. So I'll talk about that term skin integrity down there in the lab, but because their skin's already fragile, it's already dry, sometimes they're on medications and things that make it easier to get these types of wounds. Did you break anything? No. Just bruising? Yeah. So it doesn't mean that it can be less, you know, it's not necessarily better, these types of wounds. It's just like it can still involve bleeding. The blood's just got not getting out anywhere. That's essentially what a bruise is. Until, yeah, that would be closing until it, if it pops, then it would be. Yes, the black eye would be a closed wound. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's still tissue damage, but it's not open. In, the skin's not open. So there's some different types of wound, two different types of wounds. So partial thickness and full thickness. And the difference is partial thickness, it would be like the epidermis and the dermis. So a lot of skin tears, so if you see there's like a break in the skin and the skin is kind of peeled back, so if you ever had an injury like that, that's basically just the epidermis and the dermis and it's been peeled back, but it didn't involve anything deeper than that. 
So if you had a broken bone and the bone and the bone broke through the skin and you can see bone, that would definitely be a full thickness wound. So some pressure ulcers, they can be staged this way too. So like more of a superficial, just looks kind of red and angry. That would probably be partial thickness. But then some pressure ulcers, um, you could end up seeing things like tendon, bone, a lot of fatty tissue, muscle. Yeah, so that would be a full thickness wound for sure. Yeah. So also things like a gunshot wound or a lot of stabbing injuries, those would all be full thickness as well because they're going well past those top layers of your skin. So in that diagram I do, or that you, we look at for the epidermis and the dermis, the dermis looks so thick and, and big, right? But if you actually think about your skin and how close like the fatty tissue is, it's really quite thin, right? Mm -hmm. Even just like falling off your bike and scraping your knee is going to be taking that off. Oh, that's bad. So that's unintentional and a full thickness wound. Yeah. Yeah. What? What, sorry? So like a skin tear or like scraping your knee if you, so it, any wound that where you're not seeing like the fatty tissue, you're not seeing muscle bone, it's just that top piece of skin. So could a burn be happening as well? Mm -hmm. A sunburn? Yeah, a sunburn could be a partial thickness wound if it, um, like a sore, angry red sunburn would be partial. What's that? Probably part, yeah, that would yeah. be partial, yeah. yeah. And that is on your, I think that's part of your stuff there, so. All right, does everyone understand the difference there? So just the epidermis and dermis, and this would involve things, structures below it. So that's an example. So this is like nice, healthy, normal skin. So you can see the hair follicle, the oil glands, the epidermis, the dermis, and the fatty tissue. So up here is kind of like a superficial wound, like like you scraped your elbow going through the door frame, or kind of just just the uh, epidermis kind of going into the dermis a little bit. So this one involves the epidermis and the dermis. That's a partial thickness, basically. And this one would be a full thickness. You can see the fatty tissue underneath. Okay, so types of wounds. So your book does describe all of these in, you know, it does a pretty good job for these ones. So a lot of them make sense once you read through them. So like a clean wound would be something like a surgical wound. So if they are doing surgery on like a tendon in your wrist, say you're getting carpal tunnel surgery maybe. They've cleansed the area, they're using sterile techniques on everything. They open it, they close it clean, there's no debris in there, there should be no contamination, hopefully. <laughs> so clean contaminated would be something like a surgery where they're trying to do all of those things, but if it's on like the bowel, the bowel is full of bacteria, so it's impossible to get, to get rid of all of that bacteria. So clean contaminated is something like that. So like bowel surgery where they're doing it, what they're supposed to, as far as using sterile techniques, but the bacteria is there anyway that could contaminate it. So a contaminated wound, an example would be falling off your bike, getting bad road rash, and having gravel and dirt in your wound. Or even less obvious than that, so it could just be cutting it with a kitchen knife that wasn't clean or sterile. So anything that could get bacteria in it or dirt, so that would be a contaminated wound. It doesn't necessarily mean it's infected, it's just a high risk for being infected because it has this contamination inside of it. A 
and then infected wounds. So that would have, that's kind of a complication of having the contaminated wound. So it had some kind of contamination in it, like bacteria, debris, viruses, and then it became infected. So that's when there's uh, an explosion of bacteria growing in there, and your body and your immune system is trying to fight it off to get rid of that bacteria. So that's when you're going to see stuff like pus staining. There could be a smell to it. They're usually painful. Red. Yeah, if there's pus involved, it's probably infected. But um, sometimes just red alone could just be inflamed. So you're, that's your body fighting it, right? Hmm? Gangrene is definitely infected wound. Yes. So it's that's a bad infection that destroys the tissue eventually. So sometimes you see it in like toes and things, and people end up getting it amputated usually. So, so I, I didn't say chronic yet. No. So that would be that table back there, cellulitis. <laughs> yeah, so that's if it's infected and spreading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have like flesh eating, like a really bad bacteria? No, that's cellulite. <laughs> yes. So cellulite. So that may. So you guys made that connection. That's good, actually. Cellulite is the subcutaneous tissue. So tissue that's below your skin layer. So what would cellulitis? Itis. Inflammation of that. So that's in that table back there. Yeah. So something like an insect bite can can introduce things underneath the skin that shouldn't be there and you can end up with that infection around. So even something like a tiny scrape or cutting your toenail too short. So that's why when you guys see elderly people and you see this redness that you can see pictures of back there, um, you'll be able to recognize, oh, this might be something that needs antibiotics, not just So you would notify your supervisor first, and she or he might say, can you please mark the border of it? So if you see um, pen on somebody like that, they're making sure that the redness isn't spreading anymore and that the treatment is working and it's actually going down. That's how they monitor it. Yeah. So anyway, so you like back there, so you guys will be back. So and then chronic wound. So a chronic wound is one that um, despite best efforts, isn't healing. So some pressure ulcers end up being chronic. So they usually use every method they can to try to get it to heal. But if some people have poor circulation or they're not able to get off that spot where the pressure ulcer is or medications sometimes prevent it, so for whatever reason, um, it won't heal, then they'll deem it a chronic wound. They still have to keep it clean from be getting infected and whatnot, but the goal isn't to heal it, it's just to protect that area and to give quality of life, maybe pain medication or whatever if it's painful. So, Yes. Well, like, uh, they can still treat with antibiotics, so it would be IV antibiotics then. If it works, then that's what they would do at that point. So a chronic wound doesn't have to be infected, but it could become infected because it's very easily contaminated. So if you have a wound there all the time, even especially if it's in a place like on the coccyx, yeah, like the yeah. so it's really hard to get off of that area completely. 
and it's really easily contaminated. So with feces or urine or just sweat and bacteria, it's in like a damp, moist place, so it's very easily can become infected. So those are some words to describe them anyway. So skin tear, so that's, we've talked about these before, so it's caused by like tearing or friction. So it could be moving someone up in a bed but not using a transfer sheet. So that's why we're always saying like use sheets under people, use pillows to support different areas. And um, when you're moving someone up in bed, do as few movements as possible to avoid that kind of rubbing and friction. Um, so it could also be blunt force, so that's one you see a lot. So even like walking through door frames, bumping on the door frame could cause a skin tear if your skin is fragile. Or sleeping with your arm outside of a bed rail and then pulling the, your arm in could cause skin tear. So all kinds of things can cause them. Um, did I give? So I gave the example. So I've seen um, women that wear bracelets, and so like putting clothes on, that bracelet getting pulled up and causing skin tear and like taking the skin with it. So I've seen that happen too from a metal bracelet. <coughs> Yes, and that's something to keep in mind for when you are pushing somebody, always make sure their arms are not near that, those wheels. If they're hanging over the armrest, those wheels will definitely sear their skin. Rings. Oh, our jewelry. Yeah, our jewelry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why they say don't wear rings that are beyond a band. You shouldn't wear rings anyway, so when we're in clinical, hopefully we won't wear any rings. But if you have like a band or something that won't come off, then that's okay. It's less likely to injure somebody, but yeah. Um, so hands, arms, and lower legs are common spots for skin tears. Why would that be? Hands, arms, lower legs. Yeah, so those are the spots we usually bang into stuff the most. Those are the areas that usually get banged into things. Yeah. And so there are prevention tips on 966. If you've done your work, so you've probably already looked at those things. So what are some of some tips for prevention off the top of your head? You guys have already said some of them. Keep your arms in. Keep your arms in when you're pushing a wheelchair. Yeah, that's a good one. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so their feet aren't dragging on the floor or bumping into things. Padding, you said? Like, yes. Yep. Clearing clutter. Clearing clutter, that could be one, yeah, because it's easier to get less things to bang your legs off of. Sitting back in a wheelchair. Yeah. Loose clothing, yes. Yeah. Moisturize, that's a good one. If your skin's less dry, it's less likely to tear. What did you say, Lindsay? Don't overly bath people. Yes, don't overly bath people. Yep, that'll keep their skin from getting dried out. Those are all good tips. So there are different types of skin tears. So there is a huge chart that has more than just these basic types, um, but this is kind of the most basic. So you can have a skin tear where you don't lose any skin, it just separates it back, but there's none pulled off. Um, then you can have where one where some skin is lost. So in this one up here, you could bring the two edges back together, and then a dressing could be applied, and those two edges would probably heal back together nicely. This one, there's some skin loss, so those two edges probably wouldn't come back together, so they take longer to heal. And then you can have the whole piece of skin pulled off, 
so that's going to take long, much longer to heal. <coughs> that's exactly what it's like. So even when someone has a skin tear, when you're put, if um, the nurse is putting the edges back together, it is just like how you would imagine wet tissue paper to be. Yeah, that's definitely more than a skin tear. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a full thickness wound, unintentional, right? But it, that is a good point. Like something like a chainsaw causes that jagged, it takes tissue away. So that's kind of, you know, it's harder for wounds that have tissue missing to heal and get better than it is to ones that just have the edges. So an example would be if you cut yourself with a really sharp knife, those two edges will come back together. Um, but if you cut it like this with a sharp knife and take off the skin, those edges aren't going to come back together. It's going to take a lot longer to heal. Or if you cut off the tip of your finger or... would when it happened it would they were like half gone like the nails still like it's half mm -hmm. like on some of them there must have still been some nail bed in some of them like not so much right because the nail bed extends down you know a distance under the skin there so there must have still been yeah. some of that happening <laughs> yeah So pressure ulcers, so we've already um, talked about these, some in body mechanics anyway, but so it's an area that has pressure applied to it, so it's essentially cutting off circulation. And once blood flow doesn't get to an area, tissue do can't get oxygen, it can't get nutrients, and it starts to die. So that is what a pressure ulcer is. Um, and people especially that have reduced sensation. So people that can't feel it very well and can't move off that spot that they feel are higher risk for it. So that would be less circulation. So over time, if you have uncontrolled blood sugar, then you, it can affect your circulation. Yep. So an example, a client sitting in a wheelchair for six hours may have reduced circulation over their tailbone, and that's a prime spot for, for a pressure ulcer to start. That tissue is going to die under there. So prevention, the biggest thing is frequent repositioning. So at least every two hours, more if the care plan says that. And then there's also pressure relieving devices. So we use some of those in the lab. What were some of them? Things like cradle, pillows. So can rolls more to keep your hip in line, but the elbow, like sheepskin, yes. So those things that relieve some pressure. Um, air beds are big now, so people that have, are high risk, they use um, mattresses that are filled with air, so you'll see those when you're on patient. Um, so when your tissues are exposed to too high blood sugar over a long period of time, it causes damage to the nerve. Uh, yeah. And it, yeah. Yeah. So there's just a diagram of the pressure spots. So common ones. So um, feet, bottoms of feet. So I've seen some bad pressure ulcers people that sit in wheelchairs all of the time. It's a good reason to keep shoes on people, even if, as long as the shoes fit okay and aren't causing pressure ulcers. Um, or pillows underneath, pressure relieving devices under feet. If you're sitting up in the bed, you can, so you can imagine, like for you, if you're sitting at home watching TV, what are your spots that get sore and you have to switch position? Or if you're sitting in your computer yeah, chair. Yeah, your butt, your tailbone. 
Yes. For me, I sleep a lot on my left side because the baby's always over there. So my ear will start to pain if I have a flat pillow or so you can imagine Yeah, so you can imagine those places. Your shoulder can sometimes ache from laying in one spot or your hip from being on that one spot. So if one knee up against the other knee for a long time. All of those places that start to ache are the places that could develop pressure sores in people. You need an air bed. <laughs> I know. Sleep in pregnancy is the worst. So these are some examples of different. Uh, let me move that out of the way. Examples of different pressure ulcers. So they say, even just having red skin. Um, is a stage one. So if that person's been laying in that one spot for a while and you roll them over to change a product or whatever and you see a, a red blotch like that, that's the start of a pressure ulcer. So that's like a stage one. Stage two is meaning that that top layer of skin, so the epidermis, maybe some of the dermis is getting broken in some way. So it might be blistered, it might be starting to crack, it might look kind of like a shearing type of injury maybe. So just that top layer. In this stage three, the skin is gone. And you can see like the fatty tissue underneath. So the subcutaneous tissue. And then stage four, so that's when you're going to see things like bone and muscle and tendon. And you'll see those faster over certain areas. So like over the tailbone, there's not a whole lot of tissue there before it gets to bone. Right? And some of them might not look big and open like this. You might only see a tiny opening like this, but you could have a big cavity underneath as well. So that tissue under here might have died too. Yeah, the top could be like this big and underneath could be like this. So like Mary talked about packing a wound. So yeah. So these wounds yeah, so these wounds, some you can't just sew them up because these tissues won't come back together. It hasn't been like a clean cut or anything. You can't just sew them up. So a big cavity like this, when you're dressing it, you have to pack it with sterile dressing. And so I've seen some wounds that look like this big, but you're putting like this much gauze inside to pack it up. So So then there's another kind of ulcer and that's a circ <laughs> there's a circulatory type. So pressure ulcer and circulatory type ulcers. So these are ones you would generally see on feet and legs and it's from poor circulation. So you don't need pressure for them to happen, just that the tissue again is still not getting enough oxygen, not getting enough nutrients because of bad blood flow in the leg. So like Tasha, when she was on placement, saw someone with like huge, like a huge amount of leg edema, so swelling in their leg. So because of all that edema, she probably has poor circulation because that fluid's not being taken away from the legs, it's pooling there, right? So she'd be super, super high risk to get this type of ulcer. Yeah, they could get ulcers, yeah. And they're hard to treat. Part of what you have to do to treat them is adding pressure again. So the dressings you put on, or so think of like the compression sock. The dressings have to compress it as well to help promote that circulation to get it to heal. The dressings? The dressings not so much, but changing them. Yeah. Once the dressings are on, it's usually okay, but actually changing them can be really painful. Yeah, they're really painful. Oh, yeah. 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 So 
though her skin had bad circulation. Those are some examples. So those would be circulatory ulcers. So they don't look different necessarily than a pressure ulcer. They don't look different, just the cause is different. They didn't need they didn't need to have pressure for this to happen. They only had bad circulation. Um, pressure ones are treated with pressure or sorry, circulatory ones are treated with like the pressure dressing don't really have to know about that, but all of them are covered and they can all still get contaminated and become infected. Yeah, so that one you can see some bone down there and the fatty tissue up there. Is that like an ulcer? Probably not. Yeah. I said during these classes we were probably going to do the break in the middle, but um, th there's not much more to this, and then we can break before we do the lab and stuff. Did someone ask a question? Nancy, did you ask no, one? No, Oh, okay. Okay. They might. I've seen, yeah, I've seen circulatory ulcers heal. It all depends on if you can get good blood flow happening again. If you can't, it's probably not going to heal. This one has a lot of dead <laughs> tissue. It's already dead and black. So chances are it might not. Uh, the tissue is more easily damaged once it's scar tissue. It, it never comes back to full strength. Yeah. But that person will be prone to getting it. Some. Yeah. Yeah. No, it can heal if you can get circulation to go back to those areas. I've seen a woman had she came to live at Cedar Stone and she had circulatory ulcers for like. 15 years. When she came there, that the doctor we had in that unit was really big in getting rid of medications. So she cut off all these medic cut out all these medications she didn't really need. And within like three months, her circulatory ulcers healed. So there was something about her medication that was decreasing her circulation and causing for like 15 years. Sometimes people, uh, sometimes they see that the medication is needed for something. They don't always see the all side effects that someone's having. They often will just give more medication to cover side effects. Yeah. So they're getting away from that. Uh, some doctors are better than others, but I've seen them heal. And those pressure dressings, if you can get circulation happening again so that that tissue gets blood, gets oxygen and nutrients, it can heal. Yeah. Oh yeah, she even ended up retiring because of the ulcers, and yeah, and ended up she was c completely had her faculties, so she probably could have still been at home. Yeah, it was sad. She was really happy and upbeat about everything, though. She was. <laughs> yeah. So the purpose of leech, so they can get rid of dead tissue too. So this wound here, actually, that would never heal like that. All that dead tissue would have to be taken off. So that when they call like surgical debriding, you've heard, maybe you've heard of, maybe not. But they would have to take that dead tissue off it had, if it had any chance of healing. That's one thing they, they use leeches for sometimes. Yeah. Or maggots. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> So they can do it, but I see maggots can make them look really nice and clean and yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I I think I have seen that in Emerge actually. <laughs> Wound healing, so very basic. So the inflammatory phase. So when you first cut yourself, the next day it might look dead around it. That's so it's inflamed a little bit around it. That is your body's way of bringing extra blood, extra oxygen, extra nutrients to that wound so that it will heal. So that white blood cells attack bacteria. So that's part of the reason like inflammation, the redness that comes around it will bring more of those cells to get rid of any bacteria. Yep. 
So inflammatory phase is the first phase where your immune system is bringing all those extra, and you'll notice it could get red around the wound. Is there hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is something that's part of red blood cells that carries oxygen. So proliferation, that's when new tissue starts to grow. So if you have scraped your knee, it might get red around it in that first inflammatory phase. And then proliferation, so new tissue will start growing to replace the damaged tissue. And then maturation is really kind of the process at the end where scar tissue will form to cover where that wound was. So depending on the wound, those can happen quickly or not. So drainage, and this is the last piece I think. Oh no, there's a couple things. But drainage, so in the lab when we go down there, we can document some of these drainage things. So these are the new terms that I mentioned. Um, so it's bloody, just wet looking, or infected, like purulent drainage. They call that infected drainage. So up here they call it serous drainage, S-E-R-O-U-S. -E so it's just kind of clear and watery. So if you've ever scraped your knee, do you notice the fluid that, so even if it's not bleeding, there's a fluid there that happens. That's what serous fluid is. It's that drainage. That's completely normal. It's just given off by damaged tissue. So A, so if you saw a dressing like that. So what does that do? Does it like do the it, it does. It can keep the wound bed moist. So um, that's one thing a wound needs to heal is to stay moist. Um, it's also just kind of fluid given off from the damaged cells too, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what, so if you have a blister, inside of that is serous fluid, unless it's a blood blister. And then it's, sanguine, then it's sanguinous fluid, so it's just another way of saying bloody. So sanguinous is just bloody drainage. And the next one is just both of those mixed together, so serosanguinous. So that's the clear fluid and the bloody fluid mixed together. So it'll look a little bit runnier than just blood alone. And then the last one is purulent drainage, which um, would be like pus. So what people commonly think of as pus. Yes. Yeah. So, so we'll practice some of those. We'll use some of those terms down in the lab there a bit. So dressings protect them. So reasons to have a dressing is to protect the wound from getting damaged any further. That drainage, so it has to come, if there's too much drainage, if you've ever seen a wound that's really wet, what it looks like when it's too wet. So the skin is kind of white around it. it so a dressing will take some of that away so that it doesn't get that wet, that white look to it. It can be promote comfort, so putting a dressing on might make it painless. Some people just don't like looking at those things. <laughs> yeah. And that's valid. Some people want dressings and they don't want to see it when it's changed. And yeah. Then it's better. Unless your kid's afraid of band-aids. <laughs> like mine. <laughs> yes. And so actually a moist environment is needed for proper healing. So when you say, oh, take that off, let it dry out, it'll heal up better, that's actually not the case. You do get a scab, so that is your body's way of creating its own Band-Aid almost. But wherever that scab is, it's more likely to just be scar tissue and not fully heal underneath. So it keeps it moist, yeah. So that's one reason why you put a dressing on them, because it keeps it moist. And a pressure, so if in your first aid you might have talked about using things to hold pressure on a bleeding wound, so that's, it can control bleeding. 
So these four things are described in your book, but it's comp so if you have a wound, you could end up with complications from it. So bleeding is one of them. That's hemorrhaging. So that's pretty common sense. Infection. You could end up with infection in a wound. Dehiscence. So that is, for example, um, if you've had a C-section and they take the staples out and it comes apart. Yep. So that's an example. So that means that the wound come it was once together and then it comes apart. Yeah. What happens a lot with these things. So when they cut from top Depending on the how emergency it is. So they so a T shape. Th they used to do that sometimes. They try not to do that anymore because it cuts through a lot of the muscle in the uterus. So it can make things harder next time you go into labor. Um, but uh, so their default is that because is like the low transverse they call it because um, there's less of the working muscle in that part of the uterus. So it doesn't cause as much damage to the uterus. And so if they're, they always make it a certain size down there. If they're having trouble getting in or whatever, they might make it a little bit bigger. If the baby is really, really far down the pelvis and they really have to get in there to pull the head up, then they might ne ma make it a bit bigger. Or it's a big head. <laughs> but skin is pretty stretchy too, so. Yeah. They try not to. So dehiscence is just that wound coming apart, and evisceration is the wound coming apart, but your insides are also coming out. So it could be um, an abdominal incision comes apart, and your intestines are coming out of it. Not very often, but it happens. But it happens. Yeah. 